Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to what is not only a Huxley Speaker Series talk, but it's also a Salish Sea Speaker Series talk. And it's this uh, um, event that we organize in partnership with our friends and colleagues at Northwest Indian College as part of an NSF grant. And this grant is all aimed at uh, seeing that those uh, science students over at Northwest Indian College uh, have a good transition into graduate school. It's really the focus of that project. So I want to recognize Emma Norman here, who is here with the project. And I think I saw Marco. Where did he go? He's over there. Are some of our colleagues that work on that project with us. Dave Wallen, the organizer of the speaker series here, and John Ripsick was here somewhere too. Um, so they're the folks that run that grant. OK, so this is part of that. And, uh, and it started today at lunchtime with the Salish Sea Speaker Series talk that was at Northwest Indian College. So in the future, when we do these Salish Sea, uh, sea Speaker Series things, I encourage you all to go over there because it's fun. They serve food, uh, which is great. And it's relaxed, and it's just this great time to sit around, eat, get to know each other, uh, and uh, talk about what's going on out there. Uh, so it's my honor today to introduce to you Larry Campbell, Sr. And Larry is the Tribal Historical Preservation Officer for the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community and the Community Health Specialist in the Swinomish Community Health Program. And as a distinguished Swinomish Tribal Elder, uh, the greater part of his career has been, last 25 years, has been working on um, the interrelationships between tribal, local, regional, national, and international government programs. He is a frequent and steadfast speaker on topics related to intergovernmental relations, community development, spiritual traditions, and Jamie. Coast Salish culture and history. For over a decade, he has worked closely with Dr. Jamie Donato? Donatudo. Donatudo, okay. Um, uh, uh, who is the environmental community health analyst with the Swinomish tribe to develop pilot testing health indicators responsive to indigenous health. Now, she talked at noon today, but Larry's going to... Uh, be our sole speaker on the topic here this afternoon. He's also a Western alum, graduated from Fairhaven College, uh, so we're very proud of that, and he serves on the board of the directors for Northwest Indian College. Larry, I want to acknowledge that we're convened here today on traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, for which, along with your presence today, we're very grateful. Thank you for helping us learn about Coast Salish worldviews mm -hmm. and how we all can learn about those worldviews and use them to work together on the health of the Salish Sea and the health of Salish Sea communities. Mm. So thank you for being here. First of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your presence here today. Um, I'm really honored here today because I got to meet some old friends that uh, friends I made while I was up here at Western, uh, James Lockie, that we were, a lot of my interest was in anthropology and the history. I'm a historian by nature, so him and I made natural connections while we are here. Nick Zafaratis in the geography department, he was, he was my boss at Swinomish. He was our general manager and our director of planning, and he was the schemer. He was the political scientist, and he taught me a lot of little tricks. And, and we lost him up here. I tried to come up and talk to his class once a year. Uh, one time he gave me the, the added challenge of putting a planning class and an archeology span class together and talking to him in the same lecture. It was quite interesting, it was quite fun, quite holistic, I guess you'd say. Daniel Scott Rowe, thanking you. The Indian guy got the fair haven the year after I left. Uh, I w wish we'd had time to, uh, to spend together and to teach each other. And again, my name is Larry Campbell. I'm also the community health specialist for, <coughs> for the Swinomish Indian tribal community. And this is the role I'm in today. We're talking about, I, we recently uh, hired my replacement on the tribal historic preservation officer position. <coughs> so uh, I, was, I spent probably 15, 20 years protecting the archaeological sites in the five county area uh, for the Swinomish tribe and which has got to be a very stressful job because that a lot of our 
most of our village sites were on the waterfront. I always say the Swedish people knew the value of waterfront property long before the realtors. <laughs> and, but those archaeological sites also have a lot of our burial sites. And because uh, we have strict traditional teachings about, about our ancestors that it's, they're sacred and it's, you're not supposed to bother them. But in the interest of development there, all of these sites are some of the first ones that people look to. People always want waterfront property for the views and the property value. So that, <clears throat> that caused us a, a lot of deep work. But it was a place where I was able to bring my traditional teachings and my traditional education into play along with, along with a Western education. So uh, my degree here, I graduated in 97 from Fairhaven College with a self-design major called Tribal Federal Government Relationships. So you can see I put the tribal into the superior position. And I always, I always try to try to put that in a lot of my talks. It can be very ethnocentric that I'm always pointing out how tribal culture is superior to Western culture. So I hope that you don't get offended. <laughs> but it's just my manner, and I try to do it. If I offend you, I try to do it in a diplomatic manner. So, <laughs> so hi, it's to see you again for thanking you for, for your. Uh, your attention here today. Again, that's been quite, quite a bit of my role at Swedish is to uh, go out on behalf of the tribes to talk about history, culture, tradition, spirituality, environment, and politics. Uh, we quite often saw when Nick was working with this, we, we end up having a lot of interaction with the non-Indians in our community and it caused quite an uproar. And we were getting kind of cascaded every day in the news, local newspaper. And it was easy to do that because the tribe didn't respond to these type of criticism in the newspaper. The teachings from our old people was to uh, deal with it with, with action. And sooner or later that year, you'll find out to come out in the right place. So Nick saw that all quite a bit that when we're a controversy in our local area in Skagit County, we're on page one, and when we're found out to have the upper hand and we we're, were right, we're on page six of a five-page newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, thanking you, and that's been a lot of the stuff I, I, I've done for our tribe over the years, and being a, a historian by nature, it gave me a, a tremendous opportunity to do that, to be able to do this work. And, but also because I started out in the planning department. We, I ended up being the only Indian there for a number of years, so I was kind of the go-to guy to find out what would Swinomish think about different aspects of the tribal government. So <clears throat> it, it really encouraged me to think larger than myself. I, like myself and a lot of my family members, we have different opinions. Uh, but when we got thrust into this role, we end up, uh, I end up realizing that I had to respond in a way that our tribal community would, would respond, and not how Larry Campbell responds. So it encouraged me to be a little bit more diplomatic, actually quite a bit more diplomatic. <laughs> uh, but that was, that was a challenging part of the education. I've always told people that my longhouse and where I got my traditional teachings in my community, and from the elders of our community, that was my primary primary education. I didn't come here to Skagit Valley College in Western until I was 40 because I wanted to be able to have a firm foundation of who I was as a Swinomish person. Then when I come here to learn how the Western world really operates and to learn the rules of the Western world, and then I didn't see it as a conflict of that I had to choose one or the other, but we could find ways to blend it together and how that we could get our concerns out there to the greater world who really didn't have to listen to us. Today, things have changed, the politics has changed, and there's many, many instances where the state of Washington, the federal government, has to come and consult with the tribes. So we spent a lot of time trying to uh, enhance our ability to be consulted with. Uh, so 
some of the work I did when I become the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, which meant that I wasn't an engineer, I wasn't a realtor, uh, I wasn't an archaeologist, but I had to learn all these things to be able to act with them. So I learned about archaeology. I said, I didn't want to be an archaeologist, I just wanted to know when they were lying to me. <laughs> and, but w we took a different approach to it in Swedish with archaeology that some of the tribes would say, you can't go there because they're spiritually something sensitive, so you got to stay out of there. And when I began to realize that if a project serves the public good, that it was going to go ahead forward despite the tribal's objections. So we start learning, trying to learn in Swedish, how can we, how can we um, allow a project to, to happen, but still protect that thing that we think is spiritually important. So that was a lot of the work that I did, and I become known as a problem solver, I guess, that uh, wasn't anti-development, but we worked hard to do that, uh, to, to accomplish both goals. So today I'm here to talk to you about the health of the Salish Sea is the health of the people, evaluating health from a Coast Salish point of view. This is a, a map of our Sony Machines and Tribal Community, if you're not if you're not familiar with it, it's this area right in here. And this is the Swinomish Channel. That is the town of Laconner, the town of Anacortes, and this village area here where most of our people live. We have about 7,000 acres, or 10 square miles. Uh, for those of you who contribute to our social programs, that our casino is up here. Uh, our gas station in our hotel. Uh, we, tr we, try to keep our, we try to keep our economic development zone uh, separated from the tribal community. So, but as you can see here that 90% of our border is on water. So when you look at climate change, you're gonna realize that climate change is going to have a, a really significant negative effect on the tribes as far as just the, the, the one aspect of climate change is the raising, of, raising of, 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 of sea level. And again, that's just one aspect of what we're beginning to see is climate change. And here at the west end of the reservation here, we have a little area here we call Lone Tree Point, and that's our prime clam digging areas. And if you look at the Swinomish people, we've been from time immemorial We've been a fishing and hunting and gathering societies that we lived, we lived by the means of the salmon. That's how we did for thousands of years from time immemorial. That's how we provided for ourselves and our families is through the catching of salmon. We're incredibly wealthy as a people because we had millions and millions of salmon. They come back to our rivers and we had different laws, traditional laws and teachings that we had uh, to ensure that these runs would keep coming back. One of them was to, you take only what you need and you let the rest go. We still do ceremonies in honoring the salmon. One of our teachings have, have been that we, every time that we catch a salmon, that we have to thank that salmon for giving its life to us so that we can be successful. We also have ceremonies. We're getting ready for our ceremony here in May. Uh, most of the tribes in this area have their own version of like the first salmon ceremony. The where the, uh, the first salmon that is caught in the year, we prepare it spiritually, we take care of it spiritually, and we give the food after we cook it to the people. Then if there's a little bit left over, we take it back to the water. In our case, we go to four directions, north, south, east, and west. And then we return the salmon back to nature, to the spirit. And that way, our ancestors and the spirits, the salmon, spirit of the salmon, knows that we paid honor, uh, 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 respect to it, and it would continue to come back and pro provide for us. We also hunt and gather deer, elk, all the things uh, like that. We depend on our traditional foods, our clams, our crabs. These are also foods that we we begin to. Uh, we, we begin to depend on. And I guess what I'm saying is here, I guess, is what is, 
what is the benefits of these foods? The benefits is that the doctors have said that uh, you avoid a lot of heart trouble. You avoid a lot of problem if you eat a lot of fish. You eat a lot of fish. Deer, elk, crabs, clams, all of these traditional foods that are important to us yet today as Swinomish people are, if we were to eat those, and if we could eat those at 100% of our diet, we'd be really, really uh, healthy. But as it is that commodity foods come in, um, McDonald's come in, you know, we're guilty of using that as much as every processed foods. And so it became, began to start showing up in our community that any time that there was a, a health problem going on, it showed up in our communities before. We know that uh, we, when the explorers first start coming out here, we didn't have any susceptibility. We didn't have any, um, any way to fight off the diseases that they brought with them. And it's estimated that we lost 75 to 90% of our population just because of the uh, uh, diseases that happened. And then later on, we got extreme, extreme poverty in our communities because that, as we say that this reservation here is a confederation of four different tribal groups. One of them is, is the Swinomish, which this is their aboriginal area. You got the Samish who, who had the San Juan Islands, San Juan Island, Lopez, uh, Blakely, uh, 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 Samish Island, all the way over to Chucknut Drive. So this is the area of the Samish. Then you had the Kikialis, which is northern half of Camino Island. And we had uh, the Lower Skagit, which is northern half of Whidbey Island. So when we signed the Treaty of 1855, uh, they, they asked us to relocate to the Swinomish Reservation. Uh, they told me that the Lower Skagit moved here, the Kiki Ellis moved here, uh, Samish about in here, and Swinomish here. And we, we just considered ourselves four different people until, until as time went by because of we have strict marrying patterns and rules about who we can marry and who we can't. And some, in some instances, seventh or eighth cousin can be close related. So when our young people start looking for, for marriage partners or boyfriend, girlfriend, they had, to, they had to go to the other side of the reservation to find those. And it, it, it's still a problem for us yet today because that our relationships go not just into Swedish, but all to the surrounding communities also. Uh, Lummi, Nooksack, Upper Skagit, and a lot of us in Swinomish have a lot of uh, strong relationships in Vancouver Island. So <clears throat> again, that when we were 17 or 18 years old, I used to say that was the bane of our existence when we were that age, because we'd meet a young lady over some weekend over, or at some gathering, and then we'd have to go home and talk to our parents or grandparents. And then, no, 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 Sonny, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. And I thought, ah, dang. <laughs> related to all the pretty unrelated to all the pretty ones. So. <laughs> so I had to go a long ways to find wives that I wasn't related to. <laughs> when my parents got married, they got married on April Fool's Day and uh, so they eloped and by so by the time they went up to concrete where my dad was from, they the grandmother sat him down and talked to them. He said, I don't know how, what happened there, but by the time Kayak got done there, I was an aunt to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so begin, uh, it's important to realize, even though we have separate tribal communities here and separate relations, there's still a strong relationship that goes on in between. We follow the same traditions and the spirituality in our longhouses, what we call the winter ceremony, that we gather there every winter to take care of our spiritual needs. And we all kind of do the same things to Vancouver Island, to the lower mainland in British Columbia, and to the east side of Puget Sound. So we go back and forth with each other to support each other when we're doing these type of ceremonies. We started out thinking about a healthy community. We've had very, very poor health in our communities. Why? Because it seems like every epidemic that comes across America, it first hit in our tribal communities first. We started getting diabetes long before the federal government recognized it as a, um, as a 
epidemic, yeah. I'm getting old now, so <laughs> I forget words. Uh, but say the drugs and the alcohol, we didn't have any drugs or alcohol too, so it made our, re our resistance to that and very susceptible because of culture shock uh, to the drugs and alcohol. And our tribal religions were also kind of outlawed by the federal government, and so for a while there, we didn't have any way of practicing our, our, spiritual, our spiritual ways here in the Northwest. In the 60s, it, there become quite a, like a, what I call a renaissance of our tribal religions. It seemed to wake up and all the tribes in this area, we start practicing and carrying out our winter ceremonies. And then it was about the same time the Bolt decision come out. And with the Bolt decision, which said that we had the right to catch 50% of the harmful salmon, it allowed us to go back to make a living in the way that we are made, you know. We are made to catch the fish. They try to make farmers out of us, we're not farmers. We have farmland in our community that we lease out to non-Indian farmers because we're not farmers and we don't use it. Um, I know they just made a decision, Nick, the other day that they're not gonna lease the farmlands out anymore. I think we're gonna make it part of our economic development zone and probably um, an area there that they can go ahead and uh, uh, use as a, to keep it in its natural state. So, wh what is a healthy community? A healthy community encompasses all aspects of tribal relationships and tribal priorities that affect the community. This includes physical, social, mental, and spiritual health on individual, familial, and community levels, as well as the relationship between people, the environment, and natural resources. What are we saying here is that our foods, what we call our traditional foods, they're a big part of who we are, that the salmon provided the livelihood for us that we, we could provide for our families. And again, we're extremely rich, extremely wealthy in this part of the world. The anthropologists have said that we're the most tribes here in the Northwest, going all the way to Alaska, to our relatives from Alaska, that because of the salmon, it, we had some of the more complex tribal societies in all of North America. Why? Because when you have wealth, you can develop very complex social rules and traditional laws and spiritual laws in which you be able to ensure that your community survives. We had a lot of teachings about our foods and how that we use them and how we catch them. It's not so much as that how do you, I always say we, we still carry out our ceremonies. And the idea of having ceremonies is good, but what is just as good about that is the process that you use to prepare for the ceremonies. That some of our ceremonies that takes us, that might have a cash outlay of an extended family group of maybe $10,000. A husband and wife can't afford that, so, but the families that are all get together in the extended family network get in, chip together, and work together to make sure that it happens. So we divide up the cost, and it, it, it forces us as families to come together as one. And so, but when, when we have these, these ceremonies, again, the big part of that is how do you prepare for that? How do you get the fish that you're going to feed the people? The thing that we have ceremony, we're going to have, we got to have food. We got to have food. My job in my community was to make sure that all our guests and visitors who come to our community that they got fed in the proper order. We have a longhouse that we built in the late 80s that in the main room it can hold 900 to 1,000 people. This means that all these people that come there have to be fed. So it takes us a long time to really compare for, uh, prepare for these, these ceremonies and they're very complex. But again, that once that we get even and we get to take care of our ceremonies that it, uh, it ensures that we're going to be strong. So one of the things that we still carry out yet here today is that we do memorials. When we lose somebody in our family, we're eligible after four years to be able to uh, put on a memorial for our, our loved ones. And so they tell us this is the last time that we can cry for our loved ones. 
that from there, from that point forward, that you have to be, every time you think of that, that loved one, that you think of them with a smile. Why? Because if you grieve too long, that means that you have children and grandchildren uh, who get forgotten, nieces and nephews who get forgotten in the process. So this enables us to put the end of the grieving period so that w we can begin to function as, as fully functioning human beings and take care of our family. So in Swinomish and the tribes here, the culture starts and ends with our families. Our families are so important to us. And again, like I say, that we can, we can, we can claim relationships, you know, fifth to seventh cousin on down could be close related. We just had one family who brought out Indian names. A lot of us have Indian names that we use. And these are names in the tribal language, Lashitsi, that belong into our family. They don't translate into anything English. They're just names that are from the Indian language. My name is Wanasia. It comes from uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia, because I got relations up there. But, and <clears throat> with, these, with these Indian names, it encourages us to be very honorable and respectful. A certain, certain type of behavior is required of us once we take these names. They tell us, don't drag these names in the dirt, which means that you, you, have, to, you have to be good people. You have to add power to these names. So I was told when... When I received my name, that the man who had it before was a very kind and very generous, and this is a way that we expect you to uh, work, go from this day forward. Which I was saying, I never had a lot of money and never had a lot of financial resources, so I, I tried to go more to the kind thing, and I tried to be active in my community to provide, provide work that I do in my community. So I was trained to do a lot of things in my community, and. When you look at it, you, we come from oral societies, which means is that we have a lot of people like me who get up and talk and remind our people what is, what is the right thing to be doing? How do we encourage our young people to live in, in a good way? So I was saying that in my community, I'm one of, the, one of the many speakers that we have in our community, but again, I'm one of the few that can come out here and uh, talk to a, a mixed audience with uh, with non-Indian people. And I think that was part of my education here at Fairhaven was to, when I looked at it after I graduated, it was just a communication degree because I took classes in all different disciplines because I wanted to know how all of these people in these different disciplines thought and communicated. And, and so we could interact with them in a, in a positive way. We started some of this project, this out is that we started out and we're looking at public health and my colleague, Jamie Donatuto, who couldn't be here this afternoon, of having the PhD, she was asked to kind of do a risk assessment. So she did it in the traditional way that's done out here, you know, uh, in state and federal, federal governments, local governments. And when she reported back to her elected leadership, she was told pretty bluntly that this is not the way we as Swinomish people interpret health, a healthy community. So when you look at the tr traditional risk assessment, they're calculating how much toxics they can put into the atmosphere or into the environment and not poison the people too awfully much. And, you know, that's nothing less than an environmental impact statement. That's what it does. How do, how do we mitigate for the damage that development is, is going to cause? We're saying there's, and we were saying that in tribal communities, there's different things that, that contribute to good health in our communities. One is, do we still do our ceremonies? Do we still have connections between our old people and our young people? Do we have access to the natural resources that are important to us as tribal people? A lot of different things. We did 100 interviews. We went out, we went out in our community to gather interviews. It was kind of a project that started out bass backwards and then we had to kind of kind of go back and put it in a different way is that when you look at western society most of your processes kind of work from the top down especially your science and after a while it gets so that the scientists can work in a vacuum no one really knows what they were doing 
And when we were in the University of Washington, Vine Deloria was there giving a the lecture. And he, he, he told us at the time, as tribes, that, and he was telling the federal and state governments, you need to come and consult with us when you're developing the research questions. That's why the archaeologists are not finding what they're expecting in the Mound Society in the southeast. You know, those big mounds that they have there that the archaeologists are trying to say, what is there? And uh, when they excavate it, they're not finding what they suspected. And Vine Deloria says, because they're asking the wrong questions. So this is what we're saying about science, that come and talk to us when you're developing these research questions. And maybe in that way that we'll begin to get away from competing science. But so it's a process that should start from, from the bottom and work through your tribal community. But again, we started, we, we developed some questions, some of it in the Western way and some of it in the tribal way because Jamie Donatuda, who I work with, come to me and asked me to help her, you know, formulate the questions so that the community could understand it. And <clears throat> so we went out and gathered we went out and did some interviews and we recorded them and taped them and had them transcribed. And we were quite disappointed with the results. And we were trying to figure out, and I told Jamie, these people know the culture and the traditions as well as I do, but why are they not giving us the answers that we're looking for or that they're not? Uh, that's when we kind of realized that we were asking the questions in the wrong way. So the next part of our process, we put together these indigenous health indicators and we, we brought it down to a group of 20. And Jamie put together a series of questions that we would ask this focus group. And then she had me look at it and we reworded it. We reworded it in a way that, because she used it in the PhD language and I took it and reworded it so it made sense to the tribal people, the people we were, we were querying. So it's the way that they, that's the way that they thought, the way they communicated, and the way that they spoke. And of course, more importantly, the way they thought. And when they saw that, they said, oh, okay, we know what you're after now. And they gave us great answers. And so, and so again, our, our, our families are really important. Our, our hunters and our fishers and our traditional foods are really important. And where's that other one? There we go. That's the one I was looking for. Here is uh, six, um, six indicators that we kind of develop. And these words, because we sometimes have a real difficult time to try to uh, interpret Indian thought into English that some of these categories are continuing to being reworked and trying to find different words that adequately uh, describe it and uh, being able to use by the tribal community. But we said, what does contribute to, what does contribute to community health? One is community connection. Is the work there? Is the sharing there? We're taught as Indian people, as tribal people to be generous. They say a long time ago, two, three hundred years ago, the richest man in any tribal community was the one who had nothing. Why? Because he was giving it all away. He gave it all away. And where did his wealth come from after he gave the physical things away? It come back in favors. These people owed him. So any time that he would ask them to do something, they were kind of obligated because there was a debt there. There was a debt there. Still yet today, how does that work? If one of my cousins come to me, can I borrow 50 bucks? I'll pay you on Friday. Well, I, I usually don't expect the 50 bucks on Friday. <laughs> Very seldom does it show up. But it will show up sometime in the future when I need $50. The guy will remember. So when we have deaths in our community, because there is a financial cost to death in our, in our community that <clears throat> We ask a lot of people to help us to take care of the various aspects of funerals in our community. That, and all these people that we ask to help us, we have to thank them with a little bit of money and, and some material goods. So, uh, you know, where does that come from? We remember, we're taught, if that family is in trouble, if they're dealing with, an, if they're dealing with a death in their community, you go help them out because they've, they help us out when we're in trouble. So that's again, that's another aspect of why our, our communities are, are 
our families are really important to us. I was talking earlier at Northwest Indian College that we had a funeral one time and it was of a family group that didn't participate a lot and they kept back and they didn't help other families out. So they didn't get a lot of help when they were getting this, when they were putting together their loved one. And uh, one of the elders, because I was taking care of the people, getting them fed, uh, where's the fish? I said, no fish today. And I got a royal chewing out because anytime we gather like this, there's got to be salmon, deer meat, elk meat, they got to be here. What's wrong with you people? I called it a, a good old lummy chewing out. <laughs> <laughs> so I told that to our, our, our chairman, our political elected leader at the time. He said, we got to fix that to make sure that we have fish in this time. That's when we start hiring fishermen to go out to catch fish and we put them into, we put them into cold storage and that way any time that we gathered like that, any cultural, spiritual event or community event that, or even birthdays, that we would have fish available so that we could feed the people because the spirits needed to be fed. <clears throat> Relationships, again, remembering who we are and who our relations are when to help them and when they, when they help us. Uh, they say, the saying in our community is that you can never prepare for death, but when it happens, how are you, how are you gonna take care of it? In 2004, I lost my, lost my wife and my mother within four months of each other. First time I had $15, second time I had $5. And within a few days, I had a couple thousand dollars just because all of the people who recognized the work that I did for them over the years, they come and help me out. Was really scared, I didn't know what I was going to do because there was this huge cost up there. But this is what we try to do in Indian country. And long days, long before that we used to, uh, the tribe used to go out and catch the salmon, the fishermen would go out and catch fish, or they'd go shoot a deer, or they'd go shoot an elk, they'd go shoot ducks, they'd go dig clams. They would gather all these things and donate it to the family to make sure that we could, we could feed the community. So our, again, our families are very important to us. If our families start breaking down, our community starts breaking down and um, our, our concern for one another goes down. Resilience, resilience, self-esteem, self-identity, sustainability. One thing that we begin to realize to where a lot of our people had low self-esteem and were really struggling in life is that a lot of them were not proud of who they were as Indian people. Why? Because that we start getting away from our teachings and our, our Indian way of life. And then we begin to realize that if we, if we keep our teachings going, if we keep our family relationships going, that, and our young people begin to develop this pride within themselves, they're naturally going to do better. They're going to bring honor and respect to their family. So again, that's important and that contributes to sustainability to the long-term survival of the people and of recognizing who our family is and who our friends are and making sure that we help one another. Education, the, the anthropologists and the historians were telling us 20, 30 years ago that you gotta record your oral history. You gotta record your history before you lose it. Once these old people die and they take that with them, there's no way of getting it back. And our people talked about it and they says, we'd rather not do that. Why? Because where do we get and where do we still continue to get our history, our traditional teachings and our knowledge today, yet today it's through our elders. We wanted to ensure that our, our young people, when they had a question about life, they would go to the book or they would go to the elder. We want them to go to the elder. Frankly, the anthropologists made mistakes and they would continue that mistake if that's what we took would be the traditional law. So we never wanted to destroy or any way inhibit this relationship between our old people and our young people because that's where we say as time goes by, that's where the knowledge turns into wisdom and that's where we go to for these philosophical de debates that we have and trying to figure out how we're gonna, gonna make it to the next step without getting hurt. And 
the elders are, are very good at being able to see what our problems are, the root of it, and giving us good encouragement and advice. They never really tell us what to do. They just kind of give us options. They're, like I say, encouragement and advice. They would say, well, as you go about making your decision, this is what you need to consider. <laughs> and so you still have to make a decision. That way, if I make the wrong decision, I only have myself to blame and not the elder. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were pretty smart. <laughs> but the youth, and the youth are, you know, especially they're important to all of us here. Um, I am now a great-grandfather five times over. And I was saying when I was a parent, I was drinking. When I was a grandparent, I was building a career. And when I'm a great-grandparent, now I want to get in to spoil the little guys. You know, <laughs> let them torment their mother, you know. <laughs> But again, that's the heart of it. That's the part of it. And if, when you look at tribal communities, that you, you begin to understand that all the way from being a parent all the way up to your oldest people in the community, they all have a, a different part of the, the education for our young people. How many of you got mean aunts and, aunts and uncles? Yeah, you can't survive without a mean aunt and uncle. <laughs> we have a guy at home that Chester, you know, Chester, that when our kids turn about two, we take our kids down to see Chester, and he's the biggest guy in the reservation. Very burly, and he scares the shit out of them. <laughs> Makes him cry, and then from that day forward, if they don't behave, they're going to take you see Uncle Chester. <laughs> so everybody needs a mean uncle. And he's got a heart of gold, too, you know, so, uh, but he allows us to use him that way to hopefully to make sure that our, our, our kids uh, learn. Yeah, Self-determination. That's been um, a big thing in Indian politics since about the 90s, self-government and self-determination. We've worked really hard over the last 50 years to be able to get our tribal governments into a really functioning government body that takes good care of our peoples. So in our community we have uh, we have our, what we call our tribal senate. There's 11 elected, uh, democratically elected senators who serve on our, our, our governing body. And then from there, they pick their, uh, their officers, the chairman, the vice chairman, uh, secretary and treasurer, set up just about like any nonprofit uh, organization. Uh, but we've been, we've been telling the federal government for a long time, because we signed treaties with the federal government, they're the trustees, they're supposed to protect us. But it makes them very paternalistic at times, and they think that they know what's better for us. And uh, there's been some policies that have been passed, self-government and self-determination, what has allowed some of the money to bypass the Bureau of Indian Affairs and go directly to the tribes. And we're finding out as, as we go along that we can manage that better in by ourselves rather than having some bureaucrat in Washington DC tell us how to use this money. So uh, that has been a really godsend for our people, uh, self-determination and having a firm grip on our future. Cultural use, respect, stewardship, which means is that we all have, a, we all have these traditional laws that kind of say that you take what you need and you let the rest go. I can give you two instances of that, that maybe some of you have heard of the tribes. Uh, they all have first salmon ceremonies. In this part of the world, we all have salmon ceremonies that we, the first salmon that is caught, we prepare it in a spiritual way, and then uh, we bring the community together to let the, and let the salmon people know, the salmon know that we're paying them honor and respect and that they'll continue to come back to us when we do that. I, I had read in one document that they were saying that some of the old communities, they had a woman in each community, they could go down and catch a fish and they could look at it and decide if that was their run or if they had to let it go and the next one was their run. They'd say, oh, okay, this run is our, this run belongs to our, our relatives up, up the river here from us. So we let this one go and the next one that comes through will be ours. Now we look at our scientists who work for the Skagit River System Cooperative. They'll go out and catch a fish and then take a scale out of it, put it under a microscope 
and they can tell which, sal which stream that the salmon uh, uh, spawned in and where it was its place of birth. So these are places where Western science and traditional science is starting to come, to come together. Sense of place. When I was here in the 90s, this was a concept in Huxley that was, uh, that was stressed quite a bit because the United States as a whole is very proud of itself of being able to be a very mobile society that you as college graduates that graduate here from Western could go anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world to, to provide, to find your career, to find your, find your, uh, the way you're going to provide for your, your families or your future families. Almost to a person that you're going to find tribal people who come here to Western or to Skagit Valley College, they're going to want to go back home to their home communities to improve conditions that is in that community. So I told people, and there was kind of a hint of a lie in here when I was up here, I told people that I didn't come to Western because I thought it was a fine school. I come here because I could drive every day and I didn't have to move off the reservation. <laughs> but when I got here, I found it, the, I, I found it a great school. It was, a, I really enjoyed my, my three years here. In fact, Nick, I got to see Marie Eaton, who's the Dean of, um, Fairhaven College when I was there. She was out at Northwest Indian College and got to spend a few minutes with her and told her how much that one lecture that she provided me that really showed me, that really showed me I was on the right track and I was doing the right thing in my studies. And Fairhaven is a, a natural place for a lot of us as tribal people. Uh, wasn't a lot of writing there, but you had to learn how to debate and argue. And I was used to dominating any discussion I got into. And when I got to Fairhaven, all, all 20 of them were used to dominating in discussions and they could really argue. And so I learned how to do my research and I didn't open my mouth unless I really knew what I was talking about. <laughs> it, 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 really, um, it really helped me in the long run. But sense of place was a big thing in the 90s, talking about the idea that if we're going to get an education, why can't we have generations and generations of citizens of the United States stay, stay in this country, stay where your roots are, stay where your families are. I says, when your family starts to get seven or eight generations in the same place, say in the Skagit Valley or in Whatcom County, if they've been there for seven or eight generations, they'll begin to understand what power of place was. We have uh, a unique dedication to our homeland. We don't like to get far away from our homeland because that is where, that is where we find our riches. That is where we find our rules. If you look at the tribes here in the Northwest, if, in Skagit County, you have Swinomish who's the mouth of the Skagit River and you have Upper Skagit who lives further up the river from about Sidgwoli on up to New Halem and all the way up to Darrington that if you, if you look at us, we're first cousin as a people, we're Skagit stock, Skagit people, but we have different personalities. The way we go about it is completely different. Why? Because our environment is different. Swinomish, salt water. Upper Skagit, fresh water. A little simpler up Skagit. Water only goes one way. <laughs> and Swinomish is a little different. I said, it goes this way, this way, this way, this way, that way, and that way. And it stinks when the tide goes out. <laughs> but because that our traditional laws and the way that we do things come from the environment, it's, we know like how to catch Swiss and fish in Swinomish. We may not know how to catch fish in Lummi's territory where they have a vastly different uh, fishing technique, say in the reef fishing. So. We were at the mouth of the Skagit River, you know, and we built, we built little traps over there. We could have caught every fish if we wanted to, but the people knew that we had to let them go so we could continue to survive. Sense of place, practice, you know, just to keep going as tribal people. And we're, we're extremely proud of who we are as Swinomish people. Uh, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of pride, a lot of sense of place, and a lot of connections with our families. 
The last one here is natural resource security, that we want to be able to access all the things that we've accessed in the past. And one thing things that we found out is that our people led kind of semi-sedentary lives, that they traveled over a wide area in, in, in their community, not because they needed it for food every day, but the resources that we needed to survive as a community were found in different parts of the environment. So we traveled up the Skagit River to get uh, arrowheads. There's an industrial site up there on Ross Lake that was 7,600 years old that they can show that was continuous involvement of people, uh, of, of our, our families up there getting arrowheads, making arrowheads out of the local rock up there. There's a place on Cascade Pass that is almost 10,000 years old. So these, these resources that we need come from a lot of different areas. But then when we signed a treaty in 1855, we agreed to relocate to, to the Indian reservations. And after a while, those resources that were off the reservation become unavailable to us. And that's when we began to lose some of the teachings and we begin to lose the ways, how do you gather those resources today? Today, we see a renaissance in our tribal colleges and in our communities, they're going back to looking at the plants and the medicines as in the foods that are, were important to us. The plants, because that they had medicinal qualities before we had Western medicine. Our people knew how to use the plants to, to cure a, a, a lot of different things. And our foods, they become our traditional foods. And at some point in time, they really become necessary to us. I usually like to tell the story about an elder in our community. Uh, one day, the grandmother, told me and my friend to go out to Whidbey Island to gather mussels on the beach here. So I went and gathered, we went and gathered these mussels. We brought them back to, uh, to the beach. We cooked them up, we steamed them up. And then when we were just about done, we sent word out to the community that come on down to the beach. And we usually like to do that the first nice day of spring. So, you know, and so the people start coming down and my friend's mother there was sitting there eating mussels. And, she was eating really, really fast. And then every now and then she'd reach in her purse and grab a pill and, and pop in the pill. And I asked my friend, I says, why is your mother eating so fast? She says, I don't know, ask her. So I went and asked her and I said, why are you eating so fast? And she says, because I'm going to get sick here pretty soon. I'm allergic to these muscles. <laughs> That's why I'm taking Benadryl. I said, if this is going to make you sick, why are you eating it? She says, Larry, because my spirit demands it. My spirit demands it. I was 30 years old about that time, and I didn't really understand what she was talking about. Then when I got 50, then I began to understand what she was talking about. What do the doctors tell you today that if, you, uh, if, you're, if your body is wishing for something, that is your body, your body knows that it's deficient in that vitamin or whatever that nutrient is for your body to survive. And it's the same way with us as tribal people, that spiritually, some of these foods are very important to us. And this, that seems to happen at a time when we can't fish anymore. Maybe we can't hunt anymore. We can't dig clams anymore. Then we have to depend on the generosity of our young people who still do that. So again, then you begin to see a connection is that our very survival that if we're going to feed the spirit of our old people, they're going to remember us. And when we go ask them for help or advice, they're going to give it to us willingly because they said, you're, you, thank you for being generous. I always tell our duck hunters that if you have an elder in the morning walking around in his house and he's wishing for, for ducks, and you hear that message, and you go get these ducks and you put them on a string, put them over his doorknob in the afternoon, you know that you really have the gift to be a duck hunter because that you not only take these home for yourself, but you t take them home and give them to the people who can't hunt for themselves. So again, looking at tribal communities, we're still desperately poor societies, but we're the most generous people around because we're taught to help each other, to take care of one another. So th these are like the six categories that we, that we, we kind of developed. When we got to this stage, we, we, took, we developed some questions out of each category. 
and we got down to a focus group of about 20 people out of the initial 100 that we interviewed. And out of these 20, uh, my colleague, Jamie Donatudo, she put together this indicator, uh, the, the indicator questions that we were going to ask. And we brought in some what we call wireless clickers. And these are things that you could vote on anonymously so that uh, when you voted one to four that uh, uh, it registered into the computer and then your results would show up as a group uh, almost immediately. But your neighbor wouldn't know how you voted because we're a small and close community, a lot of tensions between families. So uh, we don't always agree with each other. In fact, that we quite often don't. <clears throat> but so we, she brought those questions to me and asked me if they were OK. And this is when I, when I took the questions and looked at them and reworded them for, for her and put it in a way that, in the, again, the way that we communicate as Swinomish people. And when they saw the questions, they said, oh, we know exactly what you're doing. And they give us good answers. And what we did different from other surveys is that we had people there taking notes. Because every time we'd ask these questions, the old people or the older people in there would remember, oh, it reminds me. Yeah, it reminds me. And they would talk about something that happened a long time ago. And so those stories and those recollections were just as important as the as the scoring system that we developed. So that's when we began to, that's when we began to find out the oral history that was deeply embedded in our community that people had forgot about. That's kind of the nature of oral history. It kind of loses itself for a while. But when some event happens, it seems to come back to every, everybody's, everybody's uh, remembrance. Uh, prime example in Oak Harbor and Pioneer Way in Oak Harbor, um, they were rebuilding the roads there, and they went to one of our major cemetery sites there. Just that whole Pioneer Way was just a whole big cemetery site of the upper lower Skagit people, and so we had to we had to stop the project and figure out what we we're going to do, how we we're going to cover the ancestral remains and take care of them in the proper way, and <clears throat> because that was my job to take take care of the archaeology, I went home. I was kind of feeling bad about that. Then three people come up to me next week says. Oh yeah, Granny said that there was a cemetery site there. And I said, wish they could have told me earlier. I might have saved, saved myself a lot of heartache. But again, that's the nature of some of this oral history that may mean an event or something will happen will uh, allow that to resurface and, and, and to come back. So uh, again, that our tribal governments are working with the national parks and the state parks and a lot of the state and federal agencies to make sure that we can get access to a, a lot of the, a lot of these different lands out there that have these resources so that we could spend send the people out there to gather that when they go out to gather they have laws they have rules that they have to be able to follow to make sure that they do it in a good way that they have to be clear of mind they have to they can't be angry cedar we had so many uses for the cedar in the Northwest here. It's sacred to us. It's sacred to us because we had so, so many uses to it. We used to hear rumors when we were young, when we first got into our traditional life, that some of the old people could talk to the cedar tree. And that's what a lot of our carvers who made the canoes, they could go talk to the cedar tree, and they would tell them which tree that wanted to be a canoe, and they would fall it, and they'd get a good canoe out of that. So I asked one of my elders that, I says, uh, how do you talk to a cedar tree? He says, well, I can teach you that, Larry, but you have to be ready for the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think I'll wait for a while. <clears throat> but again, when we, took these, when we took these surveys, rated them, weighed them, combined them with the stories up there, it become pretty important to us that uh, it come pretty clear to us what the concerns of the community was. And so, so the, I, I think the important thing about this is that when we take these concerns and we find out what's the priority for the people, sometimes we ask about culture. Is culture important to you as Swinomish people? A lot of them says, 
they didn't put too much weight onto it, which surprised us, because they said, we'll always have our culture. We'll always have our culture. But these other things are the one which makes the culture viable, makes it possible. So please, you know, uh, pay, pay attention to that, make sure that we can get to these resources that we need. So how does this relate to, you know, to climate change? Uh, that's the big thing that is going on. Our elected leadership decided that they weren't going to involve themselves in the argument of whether cli climate change was a reality or not, that they were going to say, it is a reality, and we're going to go, we're going to skip that argument, go right to mitigation adaptation, how we can do that. Then we started, we put together our climate change initiative, impact initiative, trying to figure out what the impacts are and how can we, how can we, uh, how can we begin to adapt to them. We run into like the rest of the public is that most of our reservation is lowland. It's 90% of our borders is on water. So as sea level rise, as the storms start to gather in intensity, that it's going to have a, a, a tremendous negative impact on our waterfront property. So a lot of that is where our casino, our bingo hall, our economic development is. We have leased lands that are just right on uh, right on the waterfront that'll, that'll probably get flooded uh, like that. Uh, Snoosh Beach, or I don't know if I got a picture of that, but there's, there's Snoosh Beach, or this is a storm that come in last winter that was going all the way over the road and it was taking all the driftwood and put it in the, into the people's families there. So probably about 15 years ago, I kept trying to convince the people that we're having 100 year storms that happen every five years now. And they didn't believe me, but they're starting to believe me now. All the climate change deniers are now applying for FEMA funds. <laughs> <laughs> but again, uh, this, this area here is probably one of our clam digging areas. We just have one really small area where it's, it's good digging, <laughs> where our, our butter clams are in sand rather than in rocks so uh, but again that it has to be about a two and a half to three foot minus before we can get to that and so we're doing studies in there we're working with the Skagit River System Cooperative which is the the scientific arm of our of our tribe that works in the survival of our, the natural resources that are important to the tribe and working with a geologist trying to figure out how is climate change going to affect the area in this area? That uh, talking about uh, when sea level rises, what is going to do? We're starting to understand now that climate change is also starting to change the composition of the water. And is the things that we need to survive, are they going to be able to survive that change of water? Maybe there's a very narrow window in there to where they have to have a certain pH or acidity to be able to uh, to do that. So where will the winds come from? Which way the winds come from? Will they be different than they were in the past? So we're looking at the impacts of what climate change could possibly do to our community and then trying to figure out what can we do to stop that. One, the latest things that the state of Washington is doing is that they're really discouraging um, seawalls. What's the other word, Mike? Armory, you know, because they were saying that when you put armoring or seawalls, you know, on the beach to stop the erosion of the beach, what it does is it just moves the erosion down to your neighbor. And so the fisheries, the Washington State fisheries and the tribes uh, are trying to discourage that. But how, how are we going to do this? We get sea level rise, you get the severity of the storms, and you get all these other things that's going to have the effect uh, of our clams and our crabs. How are we going to, you know, how can we protect those? And the jury's still out, I guess. And I guess what I'm saying here is that we have tribal science and we have Western science. Science and mathematics is the universal language in the world. So we're saying that with this work that we're doing here, it's helping us get to the research questions. What questions do we need to be asking our scientists in order to give us uh, 
an accurate look of what's going to happen in the future and then what strategies that we can use to protect these resources that are important to us. So again, that we're, as we go into the tribal culture, very deeply into it, we're not forgetting the rest of it. We're not forgetting the rest of it because again, science is, is where, uh, where these probably these answers are going to come through in the long run. And we want to be part of that solution and not sitting back in the sidelines letting the scientists study whatever they feel like studying. So again, this is, these are things that will continue on. Um, we have a tribal membership of about 900 people in our tribe. We have a tribal government that hires, that is employing 800 people right now. So a lot of our fishermen are starting to look at education as a means because the fishing industry is starting to slow down they're starting to disappear. And I was saying this, a lot of us are saying it's kind of a bad thing because if you depend on government for your economic development, it's a false economy. So again, that we realize that these things, again, as we'd like to make our living as fishermen, that we got to protect these things now. And we're just happy now that we're in a stage now that our, our voices have to be heard they have to kind of come con consult with us. And I'm not old enough to where I remember when they didn't have to talk to us. And they did whatever they damn well please. And we become uh, environmental justice issue, you know, to where we become reservations start to look at uh, sacrifice areas. So we have a lot of different issues going on. We have a ton of lawyers. We have a ton of staff people. We have uh, a, a, a pretty uh, pretty strong government that uh, makes our voice heard and I think that as, as we go through these processes that we're hoping that the solutions that we maybe we come up that will be adopted by the rest rest of the country also and we want to be part of this solution not a separate part of it so uh, keep in mind as you graduate from Western here or yet, take a look at the tribes. There's a lot of tremendous opportunity in the tribes. We've we've hired a ton of people from Western, uh, and it was just a good, good uh, farm for us, ain't Nick? Well, yeah, uh, that's where we got Jamie Dunn too. That we hired her when she was going for her her bachelor's degree, and I guess they told her to go ahead and apply for this grant if you want to. So she did and she got it and she still was after her bachelor's degree and she got the biggest grant that was ever awarded to the tribe from the EPA, $1.2 million, called the bioaccumulation of toxics in shellfish. So again, there's opportunities there because I, I think we're doing exciting work in Swinomish and all the tribes here are doing really exciting work. And uh, I think that, uh, and I guess the object of our talk here today was to share some of this with you. So when you see that the tribes are mentioned in the, in the newspaper, in the media, that there's another story of it that most of the time you don't hear. And we're doing good work out there. We're doing good work out there. Maybe you could be part of it. Uh, and, but we're getting a little bit better now of getting our people through Northwest Indian College. We're getting a lot of people who are uh, starting to graduate, you know, from college with their Bachelor of Arts degree. And we see that as a good thing as our own people start getting uh, the, 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 the undergraduate degrees and the graduate degrees, then we don't have to translate for them about how to do it in a Swedish way. I do cultural orientations for new employees in our tribe, uh, primarily non-Indians, people who come to work for us who are non-Indians, and I take them around on about a two and a half hour walking tour of our government buildings, and I try to teach them the Swedish way. I said, it's gonna take us two years to retrain you to think like Swedish. <laughs> so whatever you learned at Western, forget about it, don't work here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can figure Swedish out, you could work anywhere in the world, so <laughs> I, I, I would think that was a great opportunity here. Uh, this is the project that we've been working on probably for 15 years. It's, it's a new project, it's a new type of project. It's a completely different approach to the way that you, you approach environmental protection. 
and that's involving the tribal culture and using that as the basis of, the, of that protection. So it's been, I guess, invented from the ground up. So it's taken us a long time to get to this far, and we figure that we're only probably 25% of the way until that this, this project will really start to pay off for us. So I want to thank you for your kind attention, thanking you for your, your attention and uh, the honor and respect that uh, you paid us here today. I hope that we've given you something here that will, that will benefit you as, as you're pursuing your education. Yeah. Heitzke says him.